The Legends of the Jews, compiled by Rabbi Lewis Ginsburg. Narrated by Michael Wright, Crested Butte, Colorado. The Creation of the World, The First Things Created. In the very beginning, 2,000 years before the heaven and the earth, seven things were created. The Torah, which are the five books of Moses, written with black fire on white fire. God holds it in his lap. The divine throne, erected in the heaven which later was over the heads of the Hayot, the angels who support the throne of God. Paradise is on the right side of God, hell on the left. The celestial sanctuary sits directly in front of God and has a jewel on its altar engraved with the name of the Messiah and a voice that cries aloud, Return, you children of men. When God decided to create the world, he took counsel with the Torah. Her advice was this, O Lord, a king without an army and without courtiers in attendance hardly deserves the name of king, for there is no one to express the homage due him. This answer pleased God very much. Thus he taught all earthly kings by his divine example to do nothing without first consulting advisors. The advice of the Torah was given with some reservations. She was skeptical of the value of an earthly world on account of the sinfulness of men who would be sure to disregard her commands. But God dispelled her doubts. He told her that repentance had been created long before and sinners would have the opportunity of mending their ways. Besides, the temple service would have atoning power. And finally, the Messiah was appointed to bring salvation, which would put an end to all sinfulness. Ours is not the first of the worlds created by God. He made several worlds before ours, but he destroyed them all, because he was pleased with none until he created ours. But even our world would have been destroyed if God had kept with his original plan of ruling it by the principle of strict justice. He saw that justice by itself would undermine the earth, so he associated mercy with justice and made them to rule jointly. Thus, from the very beginning of all things, divine goodness prevailed. If not, nothing could have continued to exist. The legions of evil spirits would have soon put an end to the generations of men, but the goodness of God has ordained that in every Nissan, at the time of the spring equinox, the seraphim approach the world of spirits and intimidate them so that they fear to do harm to men. Again, if God in his goodness had not given protection to the weak, the tame animals would have been killed off long ago by the wild animals. In Tammuz, at the time of the summer solstice, when the strength of behemoth is at its height, he roars so loud that all the animals hear it, and for a whole year they are frightened and timid, and their acts become less ferocious than their nature truly is. In Tishra, at the time of the autumn equinox, the great bird Ziz flaps his wings and utters his cry, so that the birds of prey, the eagles and the hawks, are too afraid to swoop down on the others and annihilate them in their greed. And again, were it not for the goodness of God, the vast number of big fish would quickly put an end to the little ones. But at the time of the winter solstice, in the month of Tibet, the sea grows restless, for then Levithian spouts up water and the big fish become uneasy. They restrain their appetite, and the little ones escape their rapacity. Finally, the goodness of God manifests itself in the preservation of his people, Israel. It could not have survived the rage of the nations if God had not appointed protectors for it, the angels Michael and Gabriel. Whenever Israel disobeys God and is accused of misdemeanors by the angels of the other nations, he is defended by his designated guardians, with such good results that the other angels fear them. When the angels of the other nations are terrified, the nations themselves venture not to carry out their wicked designs against Israel. That the goodness of God may rule on earth, as in heaven, the angels of destruction are assigned a place at the far end of the heavens, from which they may never stir, while the angels of mercy encircle the throne of God at his command. The Lessons of the Alphabet When God decided to create the world by his word, the twenty-two letters of the alphabet descended from the terrible and august crown of God, 
where they were engraved with a pen of flaming fire. They stood around about God, and one after the other spoke and entreated, Create the world through me. The first to step forward was the letter Ta. It said, O Lord of the world, may it be your will to create your world through me, seeing that it is through me that you will give the Torah to Israel by the hand of Moses. As it is written, Moses commanded us the Torah. The Holy One, blessed be he, replied and said, No. Ta asked, Why not? And God answered, Because in the days to come I shall place you as a sign of death upon the foreheads of men. As soon as Ta heard these words, it retired from his presence, disappointed. The Shin then stepped forward and pleaded, O Lord of the world, create your world through me, seeing that your own name, Shaddai, begins with me. Unfortunately, it is also the first letter of Shah, lie, and of Sheker, falsehood, and that incapacitated it. Resh had no better luck. It was pointed out that it was the initial letter of Ra, wicked, and Rasha, evil, and after that the distinction it enjoys of being the first letter in the name of God, Rehum, the merciful, counted for nothing. After the claims of all these letters and the rest had been disposed of, Bet stepped before the Holy One, blessed be he, and pleaded before him, O Lord of the world, may it be your will to create your world through me, seeing that all the dwellers of the world give praise to you daily through me, as it is said, Blessed be the Lord forever. Amen and Amen. The Holy One, blessed be he, at once granted the petition of Bet. He said, Blessed be he that comes in the name of the Lord. And he created the world through Bet. As it is said, God created the heaven and the earth. The only letter that had refrained from urging its claims was the modest Aleph. And God rewarded it later for its humility by giving it first place in the Decalogue and the alphabet. THE FIRST DAY On the first day of creation God produced ten things, the heavens and the earth, tohu and bohu, light and darkness, wind and water, the duration of the day, and the duration of the night. Though the heavens and the earth consist of entirely different elements, they were created as a unit, like the pot in its cover. The heavens were fashioned from the light of God's garment, and the earth from the snow under the divine throne. Tohu is a green band which encompasses the whole world, and dispenses darkness, and Bohu consists of stones in the abyss, the producers of the waters. The light created at the very beginning is not the same as the light emitted by the sun, the moon, and the stars, which appeared only on the fourth day. The light of the first day was of a sort that would have enabled man to see the world at a glance from one end to the other. Anticipating the wickedness of the sinful generations of the deluge and the Tower of Babel, who were unworthy to enjoy the blessings of such light, God concealed it, but in the world to come it will appear to the pious in all its pristine glory. Seven heavens were created, each to serve a purpose of its own. The first, the one visible to man, has no function except that of covering up the light during the night time. Therefore it disappears every morning. The planets are attached to the second of the heavens. In the third, the manna is made for the pious in the hereafter. The fourth contains the heavenly Jerusalem, together with the temple, in which Michael ministers as high priest and offers the souls of the pious as sacrifices. The sixth heaven is an uncanny spot, there originate most of the trials and visitations ordained for the earth and its inhabitants. Snow and hail lie heaped up there. There are lofts full of noxious dew, storerooms stocked with storms, and cellars holding reserves of smoke. Doors of fire separate these celestial chambers, which are under the supervision of the archangel Metatron. Their evil contents defiled the heavens until David's time. Then that pious king petitioned God to remove all evil from heaven, it not being seemly that any evil be near the merciful one. That is when they were removed to the earth. The seventh heaven, on the other hand, contains nothing but what is good and beautiful, right, justice, mercy, the storehouses of life, peace, blessings, the souls of the pious, the souls and spirits of unborn generations, the dew, with which God will revive the dead on the day of resurrection, 
and, above all, the divine throne, surrounded by the seraphim, the ophanim, the holy hyot, and the ministering angels. Corresponding to the seven heavens, God created seven earths, each separated from the next by five layers. Over the lowest earth, the seventh, called Araz, lies the abyss, the tohu, the bohu, an ocean, and waters. Then the earth is reached, the Adama, the scene of the magnificence of God. In the same way, the Adama is separated from the fifth earth, the Arca, which contains Gehenna and Sheol, and there the souls of the wicked are guarded by the angels of destruction. In the same way, Arca is followed by Haraba, the dry, the place of brooks and streams in spite of its name, as the next, the mainland, contains the rivers and springs. Tebel, the second earth, is the first mainland inhabited by living creatures, 365 species, all essentially different from those of our own earth. Some have human heads on the body of a lion, or a serpent, or an ox. Others have human bodies topped by the heads of one of these animals. Besides, Tebel is inhabited by human beings with two heads and four hands and feet, in fact, with all their organs doubled except the trunk. It happens sometimes that the two parts of these double persons quarrel with each other, especially while eating and drinking, when each claims the best and largest portions for himself. This species of mankind is distinguished for great piety, another difference between it and the inhabitants of our own earth. Our own earth is called Hillel, and, like the others, it is separated from the Tebel by an abyss, the Tohu, the Bohu, an ocean, and waters. Thus, one earth rises above the other, from the first to the seventh, and over the seventh earth are the heavens, from the first to the seventh, the last of them attached to the arm of God. The seven heavens form a unity, the seven kinds of earth form a unity, and the heavens and the earth together also form a unity. When God made our present heaven and earth, there were also brought forth the 196,000 worlds which God created for His own glory. It takes 500 years to walk from the earth to the heavens, and from one end of a heaven to the other, and also from one heaven to the next, and it takes the same length of time to travel from the east to the west, or from the south to the north. Of all this vast world, only one-third is inhabited, the other two-thirds being equally divided between water and desert. Beyond the inhabited parts to the east is paradise, with its seven divisions, each assigned to the pious of a certain degree. The ocean is situated to the west, and it is dotted with islands upon islands, inhabited by many different peoples. Beyond it, in turn, are the boundless steppes full of serpents and scorpions, and destitute of every sort of vegetation, whether herbs or trees. To the north are the supplies of hell fire, of snow, hail, smoke, ice, darkness, and windstorms, and in that vicinity are all sorts of devils, demons, and malign spirits. Their dwelling place is a great stretch of land. It would take 500 years to traverse it. Beyond lies hell. To the south is the chamber containing reserves of fire, the caves of smoke, and the forge of blasts and hurricanes. Thus it comes that the wind blowing from the south brings heat and sultriness to the earth. Were it not for the angel Ben-Nez, the winged, who keeps the south wind back with his wings, the world would be consumed. Besides, the fury of its blast is tempered by the north wind, which always appears as a moderator, whatever other wind may be blowing. In the east, the west, and the south, the heaven and earth touch each other, but the north God left unfinished, that any man who announced himself as a god might be set the task of supplying the goods to the north, and stand convicted as a pretender. The construction of the earth was begun at the center, with the foundation stone of the temple, the Eben Shetnia. For the Holy Land is the central point of the surface of the earth, Jerusalem is at the central point of the Holy Land, and the temple is situated at the center of Jerusalem. In the sanctuary itself, the Hekel is the center, and the Holy Ark occupies the center of the Hekel, built on the foundation stone, which is at the center of the earth. Then issued the first ray of light, P, 
piercing to the Holy Land, and from there illuminating the whole earth. The creation of the world, however, could not take place until God had banished the ruler of the dark. Retire, God said to him, for I desire to create the world by means of light. Only after the light had been fashioned, darkness arose, the light ruling in the sky, the darkness on the earth. The power of God displayed itself not only in the creation of the world of things, but equally in the limitations he imposed on them. The heavens and the earth stretched themselves out in length and breadth as though they inspired to infinity, and it required the word of God to call a halt to their expansion. The Second Day On the second day, God brought forth four creations, the firmament, hell, fire, and the angels. The firmament is not the same as the heavens of the first day. It is the crystal stretched over the heads of the Hyot, from which the heavens derive their light, as the earth derives its light from the sun. This firmament saves the earth from being engulfed by the waters of the heavens. It forms the partition between the waters above and the waters below. It was made to crystallize into a solid by the heavenly fire which broke its bounds and condensed the surface of the firmament. Thus, fire made a division between the celestial and the terrestrial at the time of creation, as it did at the revelation on Mount Sinai. The firmament is not more than three fingers thick. Nevertheless, it divides two such heavenly bodies as the waters below, which are the foundations for the netherworld, and the waters above, which are the foundation for the seven heavens, the divine throne, and the home of the angels. The separation of the waters into upper and lower was the only act of the sort done by God in connection with the work of creation. All other acts were unifying. It therefore caused some difficulties. When God commanded, let the waters be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear, certain parts refused to obey. They embraced each other all the more closely. In his wrath at the waters, God determined to let the whole of creation resolve itself into chaos again. He summoned the angel of the face and ordered him to destroy the world. The angel opened his eyes wide and scorching fires and thick clouds rolled out from them, while he cried, Who does not obey God? And the rebellious waters stood still. The whole of everything, however, was still in danger of destruction. Then began the singer of God's praises. O Lord of the world, in days to come your creatures will sing praises to you without end. They will bless you boundlessly, and they will glorify you without measure. You will set Abraham apart from all mankind as your own. One of his sons you will call my firstborn, and his descendants will take the yoke of your kingdom upon themselves. In holiness and purity you will bestow your Torah upon them with the words, I am the Lord your God. Then they will answer, All that God has spoken we will do. And now I beseech you, have pity on your world, destroy it not. For if you destroy it, who will fulfill your will? God was pacified. He withdrew the command to destroy the world, but the waters he put under the mountains to remain there forever. The objection of the lower waters to division and separation was not their only reason for rebelling. The waters had been the first to give praise to God, and when their separation into upper and lower was decreed, the waters above rejoiced, saying, Blessed are we who are privileged to abide near our Creator and near His holy throne. Jubilating so, they flew upward and sang songs and praise to the Creator of the world. Sadness fell upon the waters below. They lamented. Woe to us! We have not been found worthy to dwell in the presence of God and praise Him together with our companions. Therefore, they attempted to rise upward until God repulsed them and pressed them under the earth. Yet, they were not left unrewarded for their loyalty. Whenever the waters above desire to give praise to God, they must first seek permission from the waters below. The second day of creation was an awkward day, in more than it introduced a division where before there had been only unity, for it was the day that also saw the creation of hell, 
Therefore, God could not say of this day as of the others that it was good. A division may be necessary, but it cannot be called good, and hell surely does not deserve the attribute of good. Hell has seven divisions, one beneath the other. They are called Sheol, Abaddon, Bir Shahat, Tit Yahawan, Sha'er Mawet, Sha'er Zalmawet, and Gehenna. It requires 300 years to traverse the height, or the width, or the depth of each division, and it would take 6,300 years to go over a tract of land equal in extent to the seven divisions. Each of the seven divisions in turn has seven subdivisions, and in each subdivision there are seven rivers of fire and seven of hail. The width of each is 1,000 ells, its depth 1,000, and its length 300, and they flow one from another, supervised by 90,000 angels of destruction. There are, besides, in every subdivision 7,000 caves. In every cave there are 7,000 crevices, and in every crevice 7,000 scorpions. Every scorpion has 300 rings, and in every ring 7,000 pouches of venom, from which flow seven rivers of deadly poison. If a man handles it, he immediately bursts. Every limb is torn from his body, his bowels are torn asunder, and he falls upon his face. There are also five different kinds of fire in hell. One devours and absorbs, another devours and does not absorb, while the third absorbs and does not devour and there is still another fire which neither devours nor absorbs, and furthermore, a fire which devours fire. There are coals as big as mountains, coals as large as the Dead Sea, coals like huge stones. There are rivers of pitch and sulfur, seething like live coals. The third creation of the second day was the angel hosts, both the ministering angels and the angels of praise. The reason they had not been called into being on the first day was that men might think angels assisted God in the creation. The angels that are fashioned from fire have forms of fire, but only so long as they remain in heaven. When they descend to earth they are changed into wind, or they assume the guise of men. There are ten ranks among the angels. The most exalted are those surrounding the divine throne, to the right, to the left, in front, and behind. They are under the leadership of the archangels Michael, Gabriel, Uriel, and Raphael. All the celestial beings praise God with the words, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. But men take precedence over the angels. The angels may not begin their song of praise until the earthly beings have brought their homage to God. Especially Israel is preferred to the angels. When the angels encircle the divine throne in the form of fiery mountains and flaming hills, attempting to raise their voices in adoration of the Creator, God silences them with the words, Keep quiet until I have heard the songs, praises, prayers, and sweet melodies of Israel. The ministering angels and all the other celestial hosts then wait until the last tones of Israel's doxologies arising aloft from earth have died away and then they proclaim in a loud voice, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The ministering angels, those who come in contact with the subluminary world, now retire to their chambers to take their purification bath. They dive into a stream of fire and flame 70 times, and 365 times they examine themselves carefully to make sure that no taint clings to their bodies. Only then do they feel privileged to mount the fiery ladder and join the angels of the seventh heaven and surround the throne of God with Hashmal and all the holy high oat. Adorned with millions of fiery crowns, dressed in fiery garments, all the angels, in unison, in the same words, with the same melody, sing songs of praise to God. The Third Day Up to this time the earth was flat, and wholly covered with water. Scarcely had the words of God, Let the waters be gathered together, been heard, when mountains and hills appeared all over, and the water collected in the deep-lying basins. But the water was recalcitrant. 
it resisted the order to occupy the lowly spots and threatened to overflow the earth until God forced it back into the sea and encircled the sea with sand. Now, whenever the water is tempted to transgress its bounds, it beholds the sand and recoils. The waters did but imitate their chief, Rahab, the angel of the sea, who rebelled at the creation of the world. God had commanded Rahab to take in the water, but he refused, saying, I have enough. The punishment for his disobedience was death. His body rests in the depths of the sea, the water dispelling the foul odor that emanates from it. The main creation of the third day was the realm of plants, the terrestrial plants as well as the plants of paradise. First, the cedars of Lebanon and the other great trees were made. In their pride at having been made first, they shot up high in the air. They considered themselves the favored among plants. Then God spoke. I hate arrogance and pride, for I alone am exalted. He created the iron on the same day, the substance with which trees are felled down. The trees began to weep, and when God asked them the reason for their tears, they said, We cry because you have created the iron to destroy us with. All the while we had thought ourselves the highest of the earth, and now the iron, our destroyer, has been called into existence. God replied, You yourselves will furnish the axe with the handle. Without your assistance, the iron will be unable to do anything against you. The command to bear seed after their kind was given to the trees alone, but the various sorts of grass reasoned that if God had not desired divisions according to classes, he would not have instructed the trees to bear fruit after their own kind especially as trees are inclined of their own accord to divide themselves into species. The grasses, therefore, reproduce themselves also after their kinds. This pleased everyone and prompted the exclamation of the Prince of the World, Let the glory of the Lord endure forever. Let the Lord rejoice in his works. The most important work done on the third day was the creation of paradise. Two gates of carbuncle form the entrance to paradise, and sixty myriads of ministering angels keep watch over them. Each of these angels shines with the luster of the heavens. When the just man appears before the gates, the clothes in which he was buried are taken off him, and the angels array him in seven garments of clouds of glory, and place upon his head two crowns, one of precious stones and pearls, the other of gold. And they put eight myrtles in his hands, and they utter praises before him and say to him, Go your way and eat your bread with joy. Then they lead him to a place full of rivers, surrounded by eight hundred kinds of roses and myrtles. Each one has a canopy according to his merits, and under it flow four rivers, one of milk, the other of balsam, the third of wine, and the fourth of honey. Every canopy is overgrown by a vine of gold, and thirty pearls hang from it each of them shining like Venus. Under each canopy there is a table of precious stones and pearls, and sixty angels stand at the head of every just man, saying to him, Go and eat with joy of the honey, for you have busied yourself with the Torah, and she is sweeter than honey. And drink of the wine preserved in the grape since the six days of creation, for you have busied yourself with the Torah, and she is compared to wine. The least fair of the just is as beautiful as Joseph, and as the grains of a silver pomegranate upon which the rays of the sun fall. There is no light, for the light of the righteous is the shining light. And they undergo four transformations every day, passing through four states. In the first, the righteous is changed into a child. He enters the division for children and tastes the joys of childhood. Then he is changed into a youth and enters the division for the youths, with whom he enjoys the delights of youth. Next he becomes an adult in the prime of life, and he enters the division of men and enjoys the pleasures of manhood. Finally, he is changed into an old man. He enters the division for the old and enjoys the pleasures of age. There are eighty myriads of trees in every corner of paradise, the least among them better than all the spice trees. In every corner there are sixty myriads of angels singing with sweet voices, and the tree of life stands in the middle 
and shades the whole of paradise. It has 15,000 tastes, each different from the other, and the perfumes vary likewise. Over it hang seven clouds of glory, and winds blow upon it from all four sides, so that its odor is wafted from one end of the world to the other. Underneath sit the scholars that explain the Torah. Over each of them two canopies are spread, one of stars, the other of sun and moon, and a curtain of clouds of glory separates one canopy from the other. Beyond paradise begins Eden, containing 310 worlds and seven compartments of different classes of the pious. In the first are the martyr victims of the government, like Rabbi Akiba and his colleagues. In the second are those who were drowned. In the third, Rabbi Johanan ben Zakiah and his disciples. In the fourth, those who were carried off in a cloud of glory. In the fifth, the penitents, who occupy a place which even a perfectly pious man cannot obtain. In the sixth are the youths who have not tasted of sin in their lives. In the seventh are those poor who studied Bible and Mishnah and led a life of self-respecting decency. God sits in the midst of them and expounds the Torah. As for the seven divisions of paradise, each of them is twelve myriads of miles in width and twelve myriads of miles in length. In the first division dwell the converts who embrace Judaism of their own free will, not from compulsion. The walls are of glass and the paneling of cedar. The prophet Obadiah, himself a convert, is the overseer of this first division. The second division is built of silver and the paneling is of cedar. Here dwell those who have repented, and Manasseh, the penitent son of Hezekiah, presides over them. The third division is built of silver and gold. Here dwell Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the Israelites who came out of Egypt, and the whole generation that lived in the desert. Also, David is there, together with all his sons except Absalom. And all the kings of Judah are there with the exception of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, who presides over the second division, over the penitents. Moses and Aaron preside over the third division. Here are precious vessels of silver and gold, and jewels, and canopies, and beds, and thrones, and lamps, gold, precious stones, pearls, the best of everything there is in heaven. The fourth division is built of beautiful rubies. Here dwell the perfect and the steadfast, and their paneling is of olive wood, because their lives were bitter as olives. In the fifth division flows the river Gihon. The paneling is of silver and gold, and a perfume breathes through it, more exquisite than the perfume of Lebanon. The coverings of the silver and gold beds are made of purple and blue, woven by Eve of scarlet, and the hair of goats woven by angels. Here dwells the Messiah, on a couch made of the wood of Lebanon. The pillars of silver the bottom of gold, the seat of purple. With him is Elijah. Elijah takes the head of the Messiah and places it in his bosom and says to him, Be quiet, for the end is near. On every Monday, Thursday and Sabbath and holiday, the patriarchs come to Messiah and the twelve sons of Jacob and Moses, Aaron, David, Solomon, and all the kings of Israel and Judah, and they weep with him and comfort him saying to him, Be quiet, put trust in the Creator, for the end is near. Also Korah and his company, Dathan, Abiram, and Absalom, come to him every Wednesday and ask, How long before the end comes full of wonders? When will you bring us back to life again? The Messiah answers them, Go to your fathers and ask them. When they hear this, they are ashamed and do not ask their fathers. In the sixth division dwell those who died performing a pious act, and in the seventh those who died from illness inflicted as an atonement for the sins of Israel. Next, the fourth day. <laughs>